Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay in beginning our presentation. Um, I thank you a lot for uh, sticking around to wait. Um, my name is Amanda Carr, and I am the trainer here at School on Wheels. And today I have with me Dr. Karina Espinoza. She's one of our tutors who's been, who will be hosting the workshop today. Um, just a few notes before we get started. For the purposes of sound quality, all participants are currently muted. You have the ability to ask a question at any time using the question pane, so simply type a question and press send, and we'll receive it. We'll choose the order of questions and read them out loud towards the end of the presentation. You may also wish to use headphones for better sound quality. Now, let me just introduce our speaker. Dr. Karina Espinoza received her Doctor of Education from USC, where she specialized in education psychology. Her research focuses on the role of adults in the formation of a learner identity for students and in fostering college-going aspirations. Using a stand standards-based college knowledge curriculum she developed, Dr. Espinoza works with schools and teachers to build college knowledge in the classroom. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, Karina. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda. I appreciate it. And thank you so much, all of you, for your patience with getting with getting started. I do appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to make a makeup offer at the end for those of you who hung in there with us. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Again, it's my pleasure to be able to share this information with you. And for today, um, I'm hoping to cover a couple of different areas. Um, what you do is invaluable and very important. So in terms of regarding building college knowledge, I'm um, going to be able to hope to cover these three main areas for you to be able to look at um, building college knowledge in a student, in a learner, um, why early interventions are more, are, are more are important sooner than later, what exactly is college knowledge when we talk about that, and how to connect building college knowledge to learner motivation. So uh, all of this in a meager 60 minutes, but um, again, I'm always available as a resource and whatever other information I can provide. So keep this image in mind because we're talking about building college knowledge and typically College knowledge is associated with that moment for a student in graduation and throwing up those caps and, well, not their gowns, but their caps up in the air. Um, so keep this image in mind because we're hoping right now, as you can see, there's no real face to them. Um, but let's continue on. So as we go, you know, when you have a student, um, a young person, a learner, um, they get bombarded or get to, they get a lot of messaging throughout the course of their education career. They hear uh, messaging around, you know, stay in school, uh, work hard and you can be anything that you want to be. Um, you need to pursue higher education. Go to college. Are you on college track as they get older? Uh, get a degree. Uh, again, go to college. So students constantly get this messaging, um, but sometimes what is problematic is not knowing what to do with all that messaging or what all that messaging really means. So that's part of what we'll talk about or I hope to be able to give you an introduction to. And to get more about the messaging, um, students get these messages along their education journey uh, directly from teachers, counselors, parents, tutors, uh, persons in their immediate environment, as well as indirectly, right? We all know the multiple media forms uh, in which students get messaging. Uh, you maybe see print ads around higher education, um, some commercials, and so on. But what happens to students who likely hear this messaging but have no personal or immediate connection or understanding of, of what that means, what, what going to college means, what does getting a degree entail, um, what do you mean by work hard, for what? Um, so that is then where we are able to focus then our attention on, on those students who don't have that immediate connection. And those immediate connections sometimes come from not having those immediate connections, maybe as a result of being first generation, uh, which is means first in their family to go to college, so they have no immediate reference point. They may have some real challenges and barriers in terms of like for some of our students who come to tutoring to you or who come to the Skid Row Learning Center who just have some challenges that don't help them connect or understand what going to college is about. So we need to be able to instill with them or share with them what the value of higher education or post-secondary education. And whereas you'll hear me talk about going to college and universities and higher education, this also, of course, can translate to any learning, advanced learning opportunity, which is why I've included post-secondary education, which could be vocational training programs, um, other kinds of certificate programs. Uh, so different forms of advanced learning or post-secondary options, which continue after high school. 
Um, so we want to stress the value of higher education, increased opportunities for different areas, personal, social, and academic growth, that well-rounded person that many of us um, hear about and, and know, uh, increased earning potential, um, that is something that always connects with young people is money. Um, being able to highlight to them, you know, the message that I say is the more you learn, the more you earn. Uh, being a role model to family, friends, and to being of service to, to other people. And again, um, and instilling that value of education, of ongoing learning, is as I said, you know, money is something that students, young people, or well, perhaps all of us, uh, <laughs> resonate to in terms of, you know, money, the monetary value of something, is what is the, the financial gain or reward that's going to come from something. Um, and but you know we as adults now can actually place different types of values on education and such. But for a young person, especially those who are really tr uh, struggling with uh, economic circumstances around family, um, unemployment, housing issues, which is the student population we deal with, um, you know, being able to show them and instill with them that um, you know the the value of education through the more you earn, the, the more you learn, the more you earn. So using an image, for example, such as this, and you can find these somewhat readily when you, if you look up, you know, uh, income level by degree or income level by education is to be able to show them um, what the value of education can mean as it translates to salary potential. And I do use this quite often. I'll cover up the actual dollar figures and have them either write an answer or try to guess what it is. And it's always a very good introduction and starting point for them to really start to see, oh, wow. And then the key question is, do you see a pattern? Do you see a pattern? And most of them will. And believe me, that's when lively discussion will start to take place around making more money and going to college and such. But I also just wanted to provide you a little bit of some, you know, academic or research background as far as why I believe building college knowledge very early or the sooner the better is so important. Um, you'll see here some research points that I've pulled out that really look at, uh, if you'll see the underlying portions of it, around expectations, aspirations, occupational and educational expectations, and again, more about expectations, that fourth bullet point. Um, so we're really talking about a young person, a student, a learner, and what expectations the adults around them have of that student. Um, the expectation that they are bright and capable and that will be going on to college. Um, so an adult's expectation of a child is so, so very important to them being able to foster the aspirations to stay in school, to see it as worthwhile to continue to study hard and get good grades and to be able to pursue alternative options. Um, the second bullet point there is always one that's um, a little surprising to folks is that interventions to influence students' education aspirations are more, are more likely to succeed if they happen by eighth or ninth grade. Other research says that by eighth grade, a child, a student will have determined that school is worth their effort, whether it's worth creating any more additional effort of time and energy to go to school to try to learn, um, pretty much is decided by eighth grade, if not sooner, with some populations who are very challenged uh, with many circumstances out of their control, um, which is why for myself, um, I'm a fervent <laughs> uh, advocate of starting this much younger, as, as early as kindergarten, and I'll share some of that. So just wanted to share with you um, some of the basis for, for doing this sooner than later. Um, and that bottom point, you know, teachers and other adults, including tutors like ourselves, can foster resilience in at-risk youth by serving as personal anchors. Uh, by providing stable, positive emotional connections. Very important role for students who are at risk in terms of economic status, in terms of just so many other um, challenges that they, they may have. This is a little bit of a long one, which I'll let you read at your leisure, but just wanted to point out that last underlying part, which I think speaks to why building college knowledge and instilling motivation around that is important for uh, students and particular student populations that are challenged uh, is that these students will need to be supported to create a vision of their future that includes going to college. If you ever want to do some interesting reading, the theory of possible selves is as fascinating and very interesting in terms of looking at you know students' projections for their futures. But just really wanted to highlight that in terms of the population of students that 
um, School on Wheels um, seeks to serve and, and provide important, important resources for. Um, so really with building college knowledge, we're talking about creating aspirational capital. Um, through this, I also hope that it motivates you maybe if you're not in grad school to go to grad school. <laughs> Uh, is to create aspirational capital, which, you know, if you look at the word, you can say, okay, it's the aspirational capital refers to the ability to maintain hopes and dreams for the future in the face of real or perceived barriers. Aspirational capital, really, when you translate it, is, is, is really nurturing hopes and dreams. Uh, sometimes for some, hopes and dreams sounds a little, a little hokey. It's not scientific. It's not research-based. You can't quantify it. But I think then now when you talk about aspirational capital, we know what we're looking at. Um, so student aspirations, that desire, that wish, that, that hope of wanting to be somebody and do something and go to college starts very early. But again, with regard to building college knowledge earlier, sooner than later, um, is, is I've, in my experience, in my work doing a college awareness program working with about 60 teachers uh, and having served about 12,000 sixth grade students is I found that you had young people who were told to go to college, to work hard, to get a degree, to move on ahead, um, but had no idea of how to do that. So then my question was always, well, how can a person aspire to achieve a dream or reach a goal or become a professional if he or she does not know what steps to take or how or when? How do you aspire to something you have no idea what it looks like? And in, and in education terms, that's called conceptual knowledge. When you have no knowledge of a concept, it doesn't make sense to you. So are you going to want to invest time and effort into doing it? Um, and that then results in this incongruence between expectations by the adults around them, their aspirations, their awareness, what they know or don't know, and then likely what they're likely to pursue or not pursue or do. So this is just a graphic. Um, that it kind of looks at that in terms of the, the alignment that's necessary um, for that. Um, I'm going to go through this real quickly only because in the interest of time and to get to some of the actual concrete examples. So when you look at trying to motivate a student to inspire them to excitement, if any of your teachers or teachers in training or you've had other work working with, with learners, is we're really talking about that concept of intrinsic motivation. How do you how do you instill that inner drive to, to want to learn, to be, to be curious? Um, and there's certain things that when a learner approaches, and this is all of us, even as adults, for goal setting, uh, for trying to achieve different goals, for a learner trying to accomplish a task or trying to learn something for a, young, a student, a young person, is what do they attribute to themselves about their beliefs or abilities? What are their beliefs about their ability to actually do something? Well, I can't. I don't know how. I don't want to. I'm not good at math. Um, I don't like reading. I, all of those are their attributions of themselves. So to be cognizant of those. And what do they expect? What, what control do they have or be able to change something? Can I do this? Can I do this? And that's the important role of a teacher, of a tutor, being able to affirm that, yes, you can do that and be able to give them that. And the important part also is value. Remember, we talked about the value of higher education. So to be able to talk about go to college and get a degree, well, what's the value? Yes, there's monetary value, so we need to be able to put a context of, do I want to do this? Is it worth my time and effort to study hard and get good grades and keep waking up in the morning and on and on and on? And um, real quick on the value, um, when a learner looks at a value of something, again, is it interesting? Is what I'm approaching or trying to do or achieve interesting? Is it important? Uh, what is the cost? And we're not talking financial costs. It's what is the cost in terms of my time, uh, the effort, the energy? Uh, I'm sure you as adults who have looked to achieve certain goals or try to complete some things, you factor in all these things. However, we as adults have better cognitive processing. We can think, think, think things through a bit better than a child or a younger person. And lastly, will this be useful for me? And we talk about intrinsic motivation, which is a, an important characteristic, but it's also mindful, important to be mindful of external factors, of course, um, which we've talked about, the environmental, family, what's going on with family, with school, with community, what resources and supports are available. So how do we offset for some of these external factors, for some of the lack of aspirations, uh, for low expectations on the part of the adults around them? Is there's Really important things that I'm sure you all do, 
already. Otherwise, I don't think you would be giving of your time and your heart to do this for students. Is you know, you give affirmation, you validate their abilities as a capable, curious, creative, intelligent person. And there's different ways to do that. The recognition, we all need to be recognized for our effort. And this is something that I like to share with, with teachers and, and others in a teaching capacity. Recognize the effort. We are so taken by test scores and grades and being first and getting ahead that students get that stress of trying to achieve and be better and be good that when they fall a little short, they feel bad. So recognize the effort and reinforce that effort is part of getting to achievement. Information. Uh, we want to provide them with information. Part of building college knowledge, or a big part of it, is providing that information. Uh, and incentives. We all like incentives. We all want to see what we're striving for. What are we going to get at the end? Uh, and of course, as you all know, um, with tutor training and other aspects, rewards are important. Um, make sure they're age, grade, and task appropriate. Um, I use. I, it's very. I feel that's very important because many times I've seen parents or instructors, student gets an A on a math test and they get a new iPod. Really? Uh, or things of that nature. Remember that a sticker goes a long way for a kindergartner through fourth grade. Mm -hmm. I have a third and fourth grade student, boys, who I thought, mm, stickers. I was so touched at how excited they were to get a little sticker on their shirt. So again, a reward doesn't have to be immense, but I'm digressing. So who are the persons that we're looking to, or that I believe can inspire and aspire students, um, motivate them, give them that you know that information and awareness they need. Is teachers and tutors. Um, you are the cultural brokers in terms of being able to nurture college-going aspirations, give them the knowledge and information they need about what it what it entails, what what steps are necessary, um, and more importantly, to have those high expectations. I'm of the belief as, as an educator and as well as a parent, um, the children will live up to the expectations we have of them. Um, and the higher expectations that we hold and reinforce effort and achievement, um, you stimulate that motivation and you continue to be that personal anchor. So here's just a summary of what we've covered to date, um, or so far, uh, about aligning aspirations and expectations to be able to foster that in our students, to start sooner than later, Students decide early, as we noted, by eighth grade, if not sooner, that school will be worth it uh, or not. So we need to start letting them know right away um, in kindergarten, even in preschool, some schools do that. The value of education and just of ongoing learning, of pursuing post-secondary education, um, and the role of, of adult agents, such as yourselves as tutors in becoming college knowledge coaches. So in building college knowledge, as you tie this into the motivation and to learning, is that in building college knowledge, we are actually generating that interest that we talked about, the interest in having college and career goals of knowing what options are out there, uh, establishing the importance, uh, communicating what the costs are, and not financially again, but again in terms of you know time, energy, effort, um, to be able to, that it's worth the, the, the cost of that, that it's useful and valuable in their lives. Uh, so this will then nurture their hopes and dreams, nurture hopes and dreams that they do have, uh, which then can translate into them nurturing um, or being to hold on to their hopes and dreams and taking those actual steps towards that. So as we continue on, um, I'm going to stop just to see, just to go over and for you to think about um, this little college knowledge quiz. I'm going to quiz you on your college knowledge and to think about what and see what you know about college, um, which you likely do. What are the types? What are the types of colleges and universities, specifically in California? What are the four systems of higher education in California? How many colleges and universities are there in California? What are the types of degrees you can earn? Name a form of financial aid. What is financial aid? So I'll give you the answers. Ready? Check yourself. Correct your answers, number one. And these are questions I've asked students, and they, they're very, very challenged with them. The types of college and universities, many, very few know that there are public and private colleges and universities. They, they don't know a distinction. Um, what are the four systems of higher education in California? What are your op options? What, what's out there? What's available? 
they have no idea. They don't know there's a California State University system, a University of California system, community colleges, and privates. Very, very few lack that knowledge. Uh, how many colleges and universities are there in California? Um, I may wait to give you the answer on that one until we do some math. Uh, what are the types of degrees? You also know some of this. The associates, the bachelors, the masters, the doctoral. Very few students can give you maybe one, but definitely not all of those answers. Form of financial aid. Many might look at you stumped going, what is financial aid? What does that mean in terms of a reference? Um, of it's what it costs to go to college. So here's just um, a definition or a background on college knowledge. It is a actual research term that was derived from a study by the Tomasi Rela Policy Institute, which I had the, the privilege to work for a few years ago and, and run the Kids to College program there. Uh, and now is commonly referred to for college knowledge of, of all persons, child, adult, you know, what is their level of college knowledge? What is it that you know about having to go to college? And this is a definition that came from that first, uh, one of the first pilot studies on college knowledge, as the bundle of information or knowledge about the prerequisites, path, processes, and milestones that lead to college. That is college knowledge. Um, so when we look at it further, um, it is that necessary bundle of information to prepare for post-secondary education, which includes the higher education options. We talked about the different systems and types. The academic preparation and requirements. This is so, so very important to start to talk to young people, to students in, in, in as early as sixth grade about preparing academically. My message to them is always middle school counts. Um, there's, there's very much a perception that they can wait till ninth grade <laughs> to get ready for college, um, but again, being able to impart to middle schoolers and middle school counts, those test scores, those famous CST test scores they take in elementary school determines their placement in middle school math or English, well then continues on to their placement. And once even you connect that little piece, you can see the little light bulb go off in their head because again, middle school counts. The cost of higher education, financial aid is very, very important. Um, many students cost themselves out, as we refer to in the college access arena, by just saying, my family can't afford it. It's too expensive. We don't have the money. Having very little college knowledge about the availability of financial aid. Um, exploring career paths and opportunities. Um, so college knowledge entails knowing that information, which I know for many of us, for most of us, for ourselves, who had, who had capital, who had the resources and support, struggle to even try to get through. I, I have a hard time completing my son's FAFSA um, every year. Luckily, he does it on his own now, but, um, but at the beginning. But again, another summary, which you can you know, look to read um, with a little bit more time, it's about building college knowledge, it's about nurturing aspirations, about giving them information, about fostering that awareness of options, of opportunities for career, for post-secondary learning, for training. Uh, and so when you combine these, the aspirations with the information and the awareness is you're really allowing them, setting them up to take the, the actions that they need to. These converge, you know, with the ongoing support into the actions that make them college or career ready. So just this, you know, it's a real brief break with regards to just one of my favorite um, poems by the American poet Langston Hughes. Is, and when we're talking about aspirational capital and hopes and dreams, is hold fast to dreams for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Um, this particular poem just keeps me going when I think about uh, young people uh, and being able to give them all that they need um, in terms of affirmation and validation to, to keep flying. Um, so how do we practice all this? How do we, how do we as the adult agents, as the college knowledge coaches, help our students think about um, career and college and learning and, and get excited about it. Well, again, building college knowledge is about being able to connect the different pieces that are involved with schooling, uh, about how to prepare uh, for going on and, and determining your career and hopes and dreams. Uh, and so really it's about these, these pieces, these pieces of a puzzle that, um, you know, we need, we're trying to help them connect to. Um, and you see that the hopes and dreams one is a little further out there um, because sometimes it can seem so impossible to do that. But again, if we tie that into schooling and into their career or occupation desire, what they like to do, hobbies and interests, what are they good at? 
I think, I believe as an educator, we sometimes fail to really tap into what our students' hobbies and interests are and their creativity and what nurtures their curiosity. Um, they can go really far with that in terms of determining hopes and dreams and aspirations. Um, so again, you know, how do we do this is by being able to provide them with the college knowledge, um, you know, which these are the pieces, if you remember our quiz, the different types, the university systems, campus locations, how to pay, course requirements, especially for middle school and high school students, uh, and so on and so forth. So how do you start this conversation? Um, well, I always have told teachers and others that I train that in terms of a child usually has an, an answer to the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I think all of us can remember being asked that at some point. Um, we may likely ask that of a child or a student at some point, and they readily likely have an answer to the question uh, with a twinkle in their eye or some excitement in their voice. They're telling you what they want to be to when they want to grow up. For an older child or older student, you know, the questions around hobbies or interests that they may have can allow you, you know, a little bit of a peek as to what they like or what they're curious about or what they like to do. Uh, for high school students, you know, what is your favorite subject, um, which they may say none, but keep asking because I'm sure there's a class or a teacher that they really like. Um, and again, and these questions tie into, you know, a young person's aspirational capital. You know, what, what do they already have within them that, you know, is nurturing a dream or a hope or excitement or curiosity about themselves and, and their future? Uh, and again, what do you want to be when you grow up or when you get older or as an adult, depending on the age of your student, is a real good, is a real good entry point uh, for early grades especially. Like I said, there's always an answer, there's a twinkle in their eye, and, uh, and again, why this would be an important question to ask, because it starts to give you a glimpse of their aspirational uh, capital, um, or what they already have within them as far as what they would like to, to achieve uh, as they grow. Um, and so now I'm going to go into some of the actual tools and activities you can use to nurture these, to nurture and build college knowledge and to start those conversations on an ongoing basis. And I'd like to share that this is, you know, there's so much to going to college or to achieving or to going on to post-secondary education that it's not a one-shot, let's have this talk in one exercise and, and it's going to work to somehow inspire and motivate them. Um, which is why, you know, the, the four areas of college knowledge, you want to have conversation around those kind of spread out sporadically so there's always college talk going on around different parts of instruction. So you can always have, if they say, well, I like to draw, is, is do a pinwheel, a career pinwheel. And you can see here just in terms of being able to talk more about what kinds of careers might come out of that you like to draw or paint or you like art. Um, for many, that association is, is very difficult or they've not been led on that conversation. Um, again, as far as, you know, some actual practical activities, it's also to, have, to read about different careers. And I also just want to add, and, and I apologize if I'm talking a little fast, I'm trying to make up for having lost uh, some time, I think, but I think we'll keep going. Uh, is to read about different careers, um, you know, and, and with that, not only do you have college and career talk, which again keeps it kind of on the radar, as we would say, this notion of, you know, going to college and studying and what do you want to be when you grow up, but you're also getting reading practice in. Uh, and I wanted to share that I have some of these reading sheets available, which are in the first person, which, you know, young students uh, especially can relate to. Um, you can see there's some of the language in terms of just to be able to start to recognize, oh, that's what a journalist does, or an architect, or a pilot. Uh, I, I think they, I hope they would know what a teacher does. But again, um, <laughs> uh, although interestingly, a, a, an antidote is many times when I've done a presentation on going to college, many, many students are not aware or familiar that their teacher had to go to college to become a teacher which was startling to the teacher herself. Um, so that was actually a lesson for the teacher as far as an assumption made that they know that to be a teacher you have to go to college. You don't know how many times I heard students go, really Mrs. So-and-so? Really Mr. So-and-so? You had to go to college? And the teacher is just baffled and confounded. But again, uh, we assume that they know or have had some exposure or know people who have these careers. But again, reading about college careers is important. 
Um, something else that also helps to build college knowledge as far as getting familiar with vocabulary and terminology is very easily, and I've done this uh, for different grade levels, or is to create a word search or crossword puzzle. Students, especially K through fourth, fifth, even some sixth graders like a good crossword puzzle or a word search. But again, if you're incorporating some college talk, as it's referred to, about different terms, it gives you that entry to talk about college and campuses and, you know, a degree or what is a major, and then you can see kind of what they know or what they don't know about going to college. Um, and there's a couple of sites that it's really easy to make. Uh, or again, I, I have some available um, and can make this available to um, School on Wheels to Amanda here. Business card activity. Um, this one also, um, usually from fourth to sixth, maybe even through eighth grade, uh, is a business card activity. Many of us have business cards. Uh, they're available everywhere. Uh, is to be able to share that with your student or someone else's and talk about what you do or what someone else does uh, in their profession uh, or what it is that when they answer, what do you want to be when they grow up. Uh, and a really good activity then is either depending on the grade level is ask them to maybe next session bring them a, bring you a business card to talk more about uh, or maybe you get one from colleagues, friends or such. But it's always a good exercise to have them, you know, if they go into a store or they meet somebody, the owner is, you know, have them go and get a business card and then talk about that but then allow them, give them the creativity index card. That should have said business index card by the way, I'm sorry. Um, when I did teacher training, I would provide a stack of index cards and students would create their business cards. And they genuinely, the creativity, the excitement of thinking about possibilities and that they would have a business card and the teacher would then post it on a bulletin board, it does a lot for that inspiration of like, wow, um, that could really be me. Um, so that's a really good activity. Um, so talking about what do you want to be when you grow up or your career or, or what do you like to do, what's a possible vocation for you, um, they can answer that question pretty readily. Uh, but again, ask them what it takes to become a doctor, lawyer, or teacher, which many at some times when my experience this didn't know, uh, a pilot. You will get blank looks, stun looks, like you have to do something to do that, uh, shoulders that are shrugged. Uh, or just I don't knows can follow because um, they know what they want to be when they grow up. They just don't know how to get there. Um, so I've been able, you know, um, so that's an important part of, okay, well, you, you have something you want to grow up to be or do or be able to, to do as, a, as an adult in your career uh, is, is, okay, well, let's talk about how to get there. And also I wanted to share this particular chart, which can easily be replicated but again, I, I have it available. It's called a KWL chart. What you can do with your student is to talk about what they know is the K, you know, and let them answer, you know, silently, or you can write it for them. Uh, what do they want to know? What are they curious about? They may tell you, I want to know how much it costs. Or do, 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 do people live there? Uh, I was once asked, is there a bell that rings? <laughs> No, son, there's no bell. Um, <laughs> which, see, again, you know, is there a bell? And can you go to, what classes do you have to take? So, again, what do they want to know? Uh, and then you can use it to review, you know, what have we learned so far? Um, and this actually is a good guide then for as a tutor to be able to look at what they want to know and uh, what they already know and, and gather worksheets or materials or uh, take them online. Um, so it's always a very good starting point for some type of, instructional activity to see what students already know, what do they want to know, and then to go back into review is like, how did we learn this? You did a worksheet, you did an activity, you went and, I don't know, you went on a field trip, whatever that may be. Um, this particular one um, actually um, is, I call it the steps to higher education, and it came from, um, I was in a third grade class talking about what do you want to be when you grow up. And, you know, they had all the wonderful answers of everywhere from a teacher and a doctor to a, lots of dancers in the room at the time and ballerinas. Usually I find that whatever is big on TV at the moment um, is what students will aspire to be. So, again, those indirect messaging, uh, you don't, I can tell you how many forensic scientists I met years ago when NCIS first started coming out. 
everybody wanted to be a forensic science. I was like, cool. Um, now it seems there's a lot of dancers. I don't know if it's Dancing with the Stars, America's Got Talent. I don't know what, but again, they're getting that messaging that's kind of nurturing their own, like, well, I want to be this. So I was in this third grade class, and they were telling me what they wanted to be, and then I asked them, well, what does it take to be a doctor or lawyer? And they sat there with their, you know, would be common third grade looks of like, I don't know. Um, so we then talked about, okay, well, where are you now? You're in elementary school and you need to finish that. And then we talked about what comes next and they knew it was middle school. So I did this impromptu steps, a little ladder of steps that took them all the way up to going up to college. And then there was a big star what that was their career, their occupation. Their faces lit up. Just even knowing that this is where they were at in elementary school, and that that's how you get to be a dancer or a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, and that was for third grade students. The teacher took a picture of the, bull, uh, the chalkboard. Um, and again, this is to be able to show, I think, all grade levels that this is how it can happen. But notice on the bottom right there, you know, there's kind of these additional supports. And that's important to communicate to students uh, is, yes, there's things that you need to do technically with applications and grades and school and on and on and on, but that there are information, there's teachers, there's parents, there are people around you who will be available or can be available to help you. Because uh, it can be very, very daunting, um, as, as some of you may know, just getting ready and doing that. So this is, you can use this, but again, if you use have the child draw you some steps or a ladder and then go through it, it's a very good interactive exercise as well. Here's another one in terms of building college knowledge and talking about what options and opportunities there are. And for purposes of this presentation, or what I focus on, is, is opportunities in California. Um, when I first started this college awareness, I asked students to name their nearby college or university to their school. There was silence. And this was in a school district in Orange County, very large school district, public school district. Um, where students were, you know, large English language learners, low income, they, they couldn't name one, despite the fact that, you know, places like UC Irvine or Cal State Fullerton or others were nearby. And I thought, okay, note to self, we, we're not going to focus on colleges outside of California. So I'm going to then show you what was one of the strongest images you can use to build college knowledge and to have a really good conversation. So here's the drum roll. You ready for this? This, this is the image you need to know about the state of California. You would not believe the wonders that a picture of the state of California does to talking about going to college. And why is that? Again, if you ask them to name one, um, most students, um, and again, we're talking about students who are at risk. I'm never particularly crazy about that term, but who are challenged, uh, who have disadvantages through no fault of their own. Again, I, I want to stress that this is not about a deficit of the child of the student, but just around what's available to them in their environment that to access this kind of information, to access these kind of opportunities and resources. And they they may be able to name what are some of what I call the Hollywood schools, Hollywood colleges. Uh, you know, USC, it's right down the street. Um, struggle a little bit with UCLA, but I'm maybe just saying that because I'm a Trojan. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, so they may, you know, the big schools, right? They hear the big schools. Uh, they may name others. But interestingly, I, I have often gotten Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, and I keep saying in California. And then they have that stunned look on their face like they're not in California. <laughs> Uh, that's one of the, okay, no, see, this is why we're focusing on California. No, but again, that part of how much how much college knowledge do they have, where they hear of, again, this is my term, and I, I don't intend to offend anyone called just the Hollywood schools because they're on TV, they have big sports programs, they're known, all of that good stuff. But again, um, it's not confined to that, or they may not be able to name any. Again, the image of California. The, Cal the map of California, and this one doesn't have that, but even you can just, again, a map of California, um, just really stimulates a lot of conversation about places and where you've been and where you want to go and what you want to do. Uh, but then when you integrate that, we're looking at the systems of higher education in California, the types that there are, the locations, the options, and it's also great for tying in a geography lesson uh, to talk about, well, what are the campuses in Northern California? California. What are the campuses in Southern California? Name me a campus along the ocean. Name me, name a campus that's to the east. 
and they start looking at the map going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and anyway, so you can do a lot with the map of California in particular because as you see here, this is an excellent tool, an excellent resource because each of the different systems have a map of their campuses that you can use. And when I have shown that to students, and, and I did a, a little um, session here in the Learning Center, um, students are just genuinely just fascinated with seeing this map. Many most have not seen this at all. They start looking at you know areas that they're curious about, where is one that's near where I live, and you can have the discussion around the different types of colleges and universities that there are just here in California, just here in California. And then you can take them through some college math. Um, we you know, talk about how many CSUs there are, there's 10, you know, 23, how many UCs, community colleges, the privates, and you have them do the math. Now, regrettably, I've had sixth graders struggle with the math, um, but again, this is also a good way to let's, let's do some math. You know, whatever basic, whatever level your student may be at, it's a good way to do some math, to be able to show them the big picture and to know the options and choices. And when they see 228, they're like, whoa, just, Whoa, they they sit there and it's just I love it. It's the best look I've ever seen sometimes so when they just like, whoa, I didn't know that. <laughs> exactly. So again, just doing some small college math with the maps, talking about the types and how many and where do they think they'd like to go. Um, so here are some actual other types of activities um, that we can use that can be done in kindergarten through third grade. And I do believe you can start even in pre-K. Because again, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do we have that conversation? The map of California, you can always have them color it, um, have them highlight the state capital, which also in my experience, regrettably, fifth and sixth graders struggle with. Um, or even we just, I sometimes will take them through and say, well, where is SeaWorld? Everyone knows where SeaWorld is for some reason on San Diego. So we talk about colleges in San Diego. We talk about the state capital. So you can always actually use it to talk about some subject matter kinds of things. Color the college mascots. Um, print a copy of your own alma mater uh, if you can in you know, black and white or if you have a, a to the extent you can get a, a, a blank copy and, and talk about it and what the logo means in the school and have them color it. Um, the steps to higher education, you can work with them to build your own steps and have them fill it in and, and then color it and draw themselves at the top of the stairs. Um, and of course, take a virtual campus tour. So many campuses have just either virtual tours through pictures or through video. Excellent way of when you can't take the field trip, a virtual campus tour. Because again, many do not have not just the knowledge, but even the 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 visual association with having been to a college campus and know what that looked like. I have been asked many times, "Well, can you can you go there? Is it free?" And have to. And then I realized that's part of the college knowledge is that campuses are open, most of them. They're free. You can walk on there and just, just walk around. I said, "You behave. Don't do don't do anything." I said, "But you can go with your parents and walk around on a Sunday and." Do some of you know, just explore, go to the library, and they're like, free? I keep always keep asking, free? Yes, free. You don't have to pay, you pay for parking. But again, fourth through six, you can, and perhaps uh, on seventh and eighth, you can do a little bit more. Uh, the career pinwheel to really have them stimulate thinking around their interest, their hobby, something that they're curious about. Um, more a, a career a, a career collage, excuse me. Have them go through magazines. Or online, I guess. Also, there's always that option with technology to look up occupations and have them put together either a poster board or a portfolio or, or paste them in the notebook so then you both have something ready referenced to talk back. Well, remember we talked about that? We talked about you know what it takes to be a teacher or a lawyer or you drew that picture. The business card activity, again, four through six, um, also enjoying the business card activity. Uh, doing some of the math, the simple math that I just did with you, but you can actually take it a little bit step further and convert to percentages, to ratios, to fractions, um, put them in word problem format. Again, just but again, there's the college talk. You know, oh, well, let's let's practice some percentages. Well, remember we talked about how many colleges there were in California? Let's use, the, let's use those numbers. California history, specifically with regard to uh, fourth grade history curriculum, focuses on the California mission. And they may be working on a project or such, but it's even just good to talk about, say, let's look at that map. Let's look at the college university or find that's nearest to the mission that you're talking about. 
Um, again, a crossword or word search puzzle also for this grade level, um, and again, the, the words that you can use um, um, for those students to practice. Middle school and seventh grade, you can do some of the similar activities if you know your student and how much their level of college knowledge is, the pinwheel, the business card activity. You could probably do a little bit more advanced math with regard to um, the, the, the types of colleges and universities. Uh, and again, the virtual tours um, that are there um, online as well. Here are some additional tools that you might be able to use or, or think about in trying to build your students' college knowledge. Um, is you know, is word maps, is build the vocabulary. So you are building their vocabulary. You are having them practice in terms of writing. Um, is to be able to do a word map for different vocabulary words as you'll see there on the left. And again, this probably would work very well for sixth through eighth grade or for maybe even high school. Many high school students aren't familiar with the meanings or definitions of some of these terms as well. Um, and of course, there's always college knowledge bingo, um, which is a lot of fun and a little hectic in a classroom. But again, on a one-on-one -on -one or with a small group, uh, I, I do have a sheet available that has the different logos. Or you can, you know, again, go and, and cut and paste create a, a bingo sheet, um, use whatever type of token you would want to use and, and, an, and an incentive or a reward. Maybe they, the winner gets a pencil or maybe the winner or whoever wins gets, I don't know, something that just recognizes the, you know, their effort or their participation. But again, there's the college talk. They learned about different types of colleges and universities. For high school, Again, by high school, um, many students may not be ready, uh, college ready, and unfortunately, California has the highest uh, student to counselor ratio in the country. It's almost double what the, the average is. If I'm not mistaken, the average is about three to 400 per one counselor. California high school counselors have twice that many students assigned to them. Um, so that tells you that many, many students are not getting adequate, if any, counseling on the academic or other requirements. Uh, hence my argument uh, and advocacy for really starting to get information and message into them earlier about academic preparation is a big part of, of achieving their dreams uh, depending on what they want to do. So, um, and that there, so for high school that there's many resources available so you as a tutor can really be you know, not that counselor that has all that technical knowledge, but just even the person who will be their coach about where to find information or just some basic introductory knowledge about where to find the information, what are the different types, you know, that there is financial aid. So um, you become a very, very re important resource for high school students who may not have had access to opportunities or to counseling. Um, I find many high school students uh, and again, we're talking about students who may be in under-resourced areas, under-resourced schools, um, and who have other kinds of disadvantages, again, not to do with them personally, um, who don't know that there's a difference between high school graduation requirements and college admission requirements, that there's a difference. You know, the A through G is what you need to get to college. Um, and and very, many, many students and their parents, their families are not aware of this. Um, so for high school, um, there's just a, 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 an enormous amount of resources available from, from everybody, which is a good thing in terms of being able to access uh, booklets, brochures, pamphlets to be able to, that you can use with a high school student or maybe even a middle school student uh, to start to talk about what it takes to prepare for these, uh, for college, for post-secondary education. And many of these resources are free or downloadable. Uh, I've listed there some of the uh, agencies, some of the entities that have resources available. Um, I also have some of these available on download um, where I have boxes at home that I can freely bring to Amanda <laughs> of those, which I'm very much willing to, to provide for you. So again, for high school students, it starts to get a little bit more of, of a crunch time with trying to meet requirements. But again, remember that there's still the option to remind them of community colleges, of uh, occupational, vocational training programs. Um, for this area, for Los Angeles, Los Angeles Trade Tech College is a wonderful resource. 
Um, so again, just to let them know that despite perhaps not being as ready academically, there are nonetheless still options and opportunities. And here's just a sample of some additional resources that come from different areas that you can um, either download or order and, and use with your student to take them through preparing and talking about um, you know, going on after high school. Some additional examples in terms of math for college knowledge um, is to use college enrollment data. And this is more so for high school. It's a little bit more advanced. The numbers are bigger. Um, and you can use you know, those to be able to practice different parts of math. Um, also, what is a good um, one teacher had them plan a college road trip and had them convert the distance in mileage and time. So they had to sit there and figure out how far it was, how fast would they be going, how long would it take them to get there, and so on and so forth. Um, and then take them on a virtual campus tour of their road trip. Um, when, when all else fails and you can't get in a car, um, and, and take off. So here's, you know, for, for ninth graders or again even middle school students, this would be a good way. Here's an example of some of the enrollment data that I talked about, you know, where again the numbers are bigger. There's quite a few of them um, and you can talk about word problems and compare and contrast and uh, have really good, again, subject matter conversation while still having some college talk and building their college knowledge. Um, in high school, uh, with middle school and high school, the academic preparation, just the knowledge that there's planning and preparation that needs to happen. You don't graduate high school and then show up at somebody's college door. Um, that there are classes you have to take, there are um, in a particular types of courses that need to be taken, and these are easily available and downloadable. Um, there's the link there, which you can have. If you'd like to create a portfolio for your student together and you put together materials and, and go through them and, and help them, knowing the counselor to student ratio, to talk about, okay, what classes are you in and what, what, you, might, what, you, might, what, you, what might you want to ask your counselor, excuse me. Um, you know, paying for higher education. This I cannot stress the importance of this particular component of college knowledge because as I mentioned before, many students um, will cost out of higher education. They will say we don't have the money, can't afford it, it's too expensive, not knowing the different types of financial aid. Or for some reason, just knowing about loans. Somehow, somewhere, uh, a loan, yes, is a four-letter word, um, but it's one of those that seems to really, they know about and, and it strikes a fear. It strikes a fear and, and they just won't do it. They don't want to even consider it. Uh, as such, but to be able to talk about the availability, availability of financial aid or as, you know, depending on grade level, there's money to pay for college. And they'll sit there and go, really? There's money to pay for college and it's called financial aid. And you can take them, I take them through a vocabulary building exercise and ask them, what does aid mean? Well, it's to help somebody. Okay, what does financial mean? Well, it's money. You know, it's, it's money to help you go to college and they get it. So an awareness of this is very, very important, especially for high school, especially in senior year. Um, so again, um, in closing with, because um, I know there's been a lot of information and I want to leave time for any questions that there might be, um, is that many times students who have particular challenges or barriers, um, factors uh, environmentally that they can't account for or control, um, their, 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 their lack of academic achievement and college attainment is even is made even more difficult by those kinds of circumstances. And they attribute to themselves um, not being smart enough, that is too expensive, uh, or just to say, well, I don't really want to, I don't really want to. Uh, when really it may be a cover for like, I don't know how to. Uh, many young people will not want to fess to not knowing about something that they feel the adults are expecting that they know about. Uh, so college knowledge is about nurturing hopes and dreams um, by showing students, young people, what options are available. And as an educator, as a parent, as having been in numerous classrooms with grade levels of kindergarten through high school, um, there is such a need for being able to nurture those hopes and dreams by letting them know about their options, the opportunities, uh, what's available to them uh, to be able to start to put the pieces together. Um, and a closing thought in terms of this particular, uh, the formal or the presentation uh, for me is that we, if we do not begin to build college knowledge before by middle school, 
students may lose out on the ability to develop aspirational capital or to nurture their hopes and dreams, to recognize the value of higher or post-secondary education, uh, and to learn the necessary steps to prepare and the ability to fulfill their potential and achieve their dreams. So I wish for you that you continue to be the personal anchor that inspires, affirms, and connects your student to their hopes, wishes, and dreams, uh, and to be the college knowledge coach he or she needs. Are there any questions? <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much, Karina. That was wonderful information, so much information for our tutors to use in their sessions. And I think especially in the summer, in the summer months when we do have a little extra time to you know, work with our students not worrying about homework, um, those would be fabulous um, exercises to do with students. Um, so I do have a couple questions um, received from people um, that we can just spend a couple minutes talking about them. them. Um, so what do you do to involve parents um, in this? As a tutor, you know, we are only working working with our students once a week um, often and maybe the parents don't have this in information themselves so how can you know the tutor both kind of nurture that those aspirations in the student and also involve the parents because ultimately they're the ones who can really provide that help for the student. Right, no that's a very good question. Um, there's a lot, a lot of of course work and information around parental involvement and parental engagement but you can approach it very similarly that if the student or the child doesn't know the parent doesn't no, either. It's it's almost they don't know what they don't know, uh, and to be able to engage a parent, um, if possible, to have include the parent in an introductory conversation, or initially I, I would have the introductory conversation with the student about what do you want to be when you grow up, wishes, dreams. Uh, but when you start to talk about how to how to get there with the college knowledge and the types of and the where, especially around the map exercise, as uh, to maybe invite the parent to the session so that you get, they, they can have conversation at home. Because the conversation, as I tell teachers, the conversation, yes, needs to happen in the classroom, at home, and in the street. And by in the street, I mean amongst peers, amongst friends. If we can get students to talk to one another about going to college, that's an additional layer of, of building that college knowledge. But with a parent, is to be able to invite them perhaps when you know you're going to use the maps, uh, which I can't stress enough are a really good entry point to, to, to building college knowledge. So that might be a way to do the have them come in maybe for once to talk, and to, so they know that you're going to be talking about this with their student. And then thereafter perhaps give your child, give your child, your student, now I'm thinking as a parent with a child. So as a tutor with your student, just when you do some activities, just have them take it home and hopefully they'll talk about it and you can have them either sign it or say, you know, ask your, ask your mom or dad or your guardian to write a question down on the worksheet so we can talk about it. Um, so again, it's very important to include the parent. And again, if they don't, the student does not know, it's likely that the parent does not know. Again, not necessarily through any kind of deficit or deterrent on their part, but um, it's to include them. Invite them in for the talk on the maps. That's a great suggestion. Um, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. We had so much great information from you, Karina. Um, if you do have extra questions, we can I can always uh, forward them on to Karina um, after the session. So we do have a question here from a tutor who is working with uh, both a second and a seventh grader in the same session. And do you have any suggestions for her um, as far as activities that might be good for both students? Um, again, um, what comes to mind um, is that you can probably do is probably like if you want to talk about what they want to be before they grow up, given that there's this you know, the difference in the age level, is that pinwheel where they can do it kind of independently, depending on what each likes and what each they can come up with, and then talk simultaneously about you know the different options that can come out of a hobby or interest, because that's really the the goal, the premise of that exercise is you know that there are career and, and occupational things that can come out of an interest or a hobby or a talent they have. And of course, you know, the maps. Uh, I can't stress those enough. I mean, um, I have a second grader and a fourth grader, um, so initially I thought, uh, but again, even just the maps, the seventh grader may not know about all those, and the second grader definitely won't know that that, and may not conceptually be able to process it like the seventh grader, but again, it's never too early to show them the map and options. And the second grader would love to color it, so you're able to engage both of them, I think, with regard to that and start talking about it. 
That is a great idea. Thank you so much for offering all of your expertise today, Karina. I think that these are going to be great exercises for our tutors to do. Um, and thank you all for attending the workshop today. Um, we really appreciate it, taking some time out of your day to, um, to talk with us and to um, think about ways to help build your college knowledge for your student. Um, I do want to have a couple of announcements. We have some upcoming workshops this summer. So on July 23rd, Thursday at noon, we're going to have Get Creative with the Arts with Lauren Kinney, and she will be speaking about integrating the arts into your tutoring sessions, which is another great activity for the summer. Um, and then on August 19th, we are going to have a workshop with Anita Weir called Making Math Fun. And she's going to be discussing some techniques to, um, to help both tutors and students kind of engage a little bit with math and make it fun. And we, uh, I just also wanted to mention our summer program. Now, most tutors have been receiving emails about our summer program, and um, you should just keep an eye out for those. Sometimes they get filtered into the spam mailbox. Um, but we do have a wonderful program created this summer. Um, for use this summer on filling in those gaps in your students' learning. And I would encourage you all to go onto our website if you haven't already and check out all of the great resources that we've compiled. Um, and uh, if you have, of course, any questions, you can direct them to me. Um, and any question, questions 